Well, good evening, folks. This is Dave Smeltz with uh, Back to the Scripture podcast here at 8 o'clock in the evening. I'm glad that uh, some of you have tuned in. I, I've been very busy, been working on my office. You can see behind me here, I've been painting inside, and my closet doors are down, and I'm trying to get stuff squared away, and I just praise God for um, what we're able to do and how we're able to do it. Uh, I'm going to tonight uh, uh, share some things with you. I hope it will be a blessing to you. The message is do not put, do not put, do not put your candle under a bushel. I'm slow at typing, folks. Do not put your candle under a bushel. Amen. So I hope you get that's the title for the message tonight. It'll be coming from Mark chapter 4 verses 21 through 34. And so uh, we'll be talking on that just a few minutes. I'm glad that you've tuned in. And um, a lot's taken place this last week since we last talked. I, I talked in between one day this week. I mentioned to you about what was taking place. I do want to say this. If some of you have been following me for many, many years. And um, some of the things that I've said over the years, I, I sometimes I, I shock myself at the things that I believe that God gives to me and they come true. Uh, I, um, I have predicted uh, for the last uh, five years, uh, actually I started back when Obama was uh, took over as president, that we were heading towards something like we're seeing today in our country. Rebellion, we're seeing uh, signs of anarchy, uh, even signs of revolution. Now I, I don't know how all this is going to work out and I don't want to scare anyone. But you can't go in the course that we've been going. You can't do what we've been doing and not expect some type of results to come off of it. You can't kill millions of babies. You can't uh, 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 do the things that we do and in, in laws that we pass and expect some type of retribution that's going to come our way. You know, we have moved away from uh, morality uh, tremendously away from morality and our nation has changed it's changed drastically since I was a child and I can't believe how much it's changed and for some of you it's changed a lot so the reality is is that the things that we're seeing today and I don't know this for sure and I, no one knows the hour that the Lord is coming back but it sure looks like not only here in the United States but around the world around the world is where we're seeing a lot of things going on. Not just here in the States. We started, uh, you know, the first of the year uh, with the pandemic. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you remember back many years ago, I think I was a teenager, there was a song that was written in the year 2025. I looked that up today and I just to see what it had to say. And it goes in the year 2025, 35, 45, and it keeps on going up. And uh, one, the finally near the last of us is finally God. And it's like 20,800, uh, 20, something like that. And the reality is, is that God is everywhere, folks. And uh, what we're seeing is, it, it, we're seeing things that people have brought on themselves. God didn't bring this on. God, uh, God allowed it to happen because of the fact that people uh, won't listen to him and they won't do what he tells them to do. And the result of that, of course, that's called sin. The result of that is judgment. And God uses things. We, you know, God, has, God can do anything he wants to do, folks. Anything. And as you read the Old Testament you find uh, pandemics are very, very real in the Old Testament. And even even some in the New Testament, we see that Jesus used things like that. He talked about that. So, I mean, the reality is the future. Revelation 
tells us that pandemics will be very much a part of the end times. Now, I don't know if this uh, virus is part of that or not, but uh, all these things can be looked at prospectively and we can open our eyes and say whether or not it's real or not. I mean, what we've seen in the last three or four days, five days, with all of this demonstrations and rioting and looting, is we've seen a lot of people out there that have been in the house and been not allowed to go out for three months. And uh, it's some of them, I think part of this is just blowing off steam. And uh, uh, some of it is just downright meanness because we have a, a mean group of people out there. And uh, I, they're out to hurt. And this is the big problem that we face. Now, folks, this is everybody. This is every race. I mean, this is not just one race. I do have a little problem with the fact of, of uh, certain people claiming that everybody owes them something because of the fact of their ancestry and what people did to them. I, I, don't, I disagree with that because many people grew up poor and many people didn't have much. I, I came, my family was not a rich family. I, I grew up in pretty much a poor house that we didn't have much at all. I had one closet and probably could have had three outfits in it. One that I could wear to school and one that I could play in and one for extra. I know I had two pairs of shoes and a pair. Of, I think I had a pair of sneakers, but I mean the reality is is that most of us, you know, grew up didn't have a silver spoon in our mouth. Uh, I went to work when I was ten years old because my daddy said if you want to work and make you have anything, you got to work for it. And I did. I went to work at ten years old. Worked with a plumber and um, I dug ditches and um, went in the military when I was seventeen. You know, uh, I, my life has not been the easiest life. Of course, I worked my way all the way through Bible college and worked my way all the way through. I had got a master's degree in theology and, and a doctorate degree, a doctorate of divinity degree. All oh, those are all earned degrees. And I, I went to school till I was 40 years old. And uh, I mean, my goal was reaching about the time I was 40 years old. I don't claim to be a very educated man. I, I learned what I could. I had a hard time learning because I wasn't, uh, never been that, that smart. But I praise God for what intelligence that God gave me. And when I look and I see the world the way it is, a lot of it to me is common sense and watching what the cause and effect, watching people what they do, and then also knowing what God's word says about certain things. You know, why, why do Christians do what they do? Why do they follow God? Why do they follow Christ? Is that a fear? No, I, I, I don't think it's out of fear. I think it's out of love. Because I think they realize that uh, Jesus died for them and that he's the Savior of the world. And that if, if they have any hope whatsoever, it's going to be in him because they surely can't earn their way. Uh, you, you, you come into this world naked and you leave this world naked. You don't take anything with you when you die. The only thing that goes with you is what's clothes on your back, and that don't amount to anything. And that's not going to go to heaven with you, because it's absent from the body. It means to be present with the Lord. So, I mean, the whole reality is uh, one guy tried to, he wanted to take his, uh, his uh, Corvette. So he asked him to bury him in this Corvette. And so they dug this big hole and they put a Corvette in the ground, put him in there and kind of, I don't know, had some type of top on it to, to keep him where he was with the air and, you know, keep him from decaying as quickly. And, I mean, he, 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 he was buried in his, in his Corvette. Hey, that's the crazy stuff of people, man. They're nuts. So, I mean, this is the thing that you're seeing today is you're seeing some unhappy people. You're seeing people who want something for nothing. You take about all the rooting and rioting that's taking place. Look at people running in and out of the stores. Tonight I, I saw them going into a, uh, a liquor store, bringing out bottles and bottles of liquor. What are they going to do with that liquor? They're going to drink it is what they're going to do. And they're going to get drunk. And they're going to even be more riotous than what they are because when they get drunk. And then they're going into the Target stores and coming out not with one TV but five or six TVs on a cart. I mean, these this is a this is an awful awful group of people. That these people are mean. These people are are very selfish and very self-centered. They don't care about the hard-working man. They don't care about what it means to work for something. They want everything for nothing, and if they can't, they steal it. 
And so this is the thing, and I, and I mean, who all these people that do it, it's just, just one group of people, it's everybody that goes in the store and does that. But the interesting thing is, is I, I think a lot of them are young. I don't think they're very old. I think a lot of them are very, very young. And I mean, right now, with, with the economic condition in the country, 40 million people out of work because of this uh, pandemic, you know, th that's making it tough on people. So people are going to do anything they can and whatever they can to survive. And it may get worse because if the economy doesn't change and if this virus should come back because of what these people are doing and you know, going out and congregating together in such large masses, if this virus comes back, it could be worse than it's ever been. And the interesting thing that you're going to see is this virus is going to come back to the bigger cities because that's where all of this is taking place. It's not in the real small towns. It's in the bigger cities and in every state now, every state. Uh, my family lives up in Virginia, and my son-in-law is telling me it's in Roanoke. It's, it's everywhere. Folks, I want to tell you something. It's, it's crazy to think about what's taking place. Because they're, they're all kind and what is it? Because of one man who was, uh, who was basically strangled, that was a chokehold, uh, to death on the street. Now, I, I know he shouldn't have done that, and he was wrong, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. And uh, uh, he basically, if you want to know the truth, he did, he killed that man. He held him, to, he held him so long that he died. And that's not the purpose of a chokehold. A chokehold is supposed to take a person you're supposed to, not until they go to sleep and then you forget it. That's all you're supposed to do with it. But he didn't. He stayed right there until, until he actually killed that man. And that was wrong. That was really, really wrong. And, uh, you know, but there's a lot of mean people out there. What makes a person mean? What makes a person mean? Let me tell you what I think makes a person mean. First of all, number one, I think I qualify in this area. I'm a veteran. I served in the Vietnam War. I am a combat veteran, and it uh, means I was in combat. It means that I was in battle. It means, and I have awards showing all of that, and some medals of all that stuff, where I was in battle. I was a young man. I was 17 years old when I went into service. I was 18 and a half when I went to Vietnam. Uh, friends, let me tell you something. When you get into a situation that you see people around you, that are dying and you see all kinds of things that are going on and you're looking at that enemy you're looking at the people that are causing all the problem it can disturb you and it can cause you to do things that you wish that you had never done and I saw a young man because of what the Vietnamese did to our American boys I saw men do some pretty brutal stuff to the Vietnamese because of what they had done to their own and when these policemen go out and they have to deal with people all the time and they have to go into communities uh, psych evaluation probably would be the best thing to take on one every six months to see where they are when it comes to what they have to deal with because these things work on you there's a hate that comes up inside of you there's a desire to dislike these things are very very real I saw people, young men, when I was in the in the service that were, when I was, we first went in together, they were calm, but in combat, after seeing death and seeing all the things, they became very mean, extremely mean. I saw a lot of men die because they came so out of focus that they lost their whole place of what they were doing and they ended up losing their own life out of their own ignorance. You, you, you look at the people that are doing this right now. You look at they're going out there and they're, they're demonstrating and they're rioting and they're doing all the things that they're doing. They don't realize, they have not the common sense to realize there is still a pandemic going on. There's still the virus. And what's going to end up is that if this goes the way I think it's going to go, I think the virus is going to come back through those individual people. A lot of them are going to die because of their foolishness and their stupidity of going out in the streets. Now, let me just say this. I heard the other day that one of the big questions that came from the black community is why has this virus affected the black community mostly? Well, anybody knows if you study this virus, it affects people who have a, a low stamina or they may have diabetes or have other things. 
the black community is, and I'm, I have diabetes, so don't get mad at me. A lot, the black community, a lot of them have diabetes. They have heart disease. They have different diseases. So what happens is, and I'm talking about young people. I'm talking about. I'm not talking about old people. I'm talking about young. And so what happens? This went to the weakest link. And what was the weakest link? Those that are sick. Now those same people that are out there right now, which are sick, they're going to spread that virus onto other people because of the fact that they're not. They don't care. They don't see it. And and people are so much sad. They're thinking about one thing. One man which was killed, and the, the law will take care of that officer that did that. He will, the law will. There is a procedure of law that you have to go through, and sometimes the law is very, very slow. There are people that can appeal and appeal and appeal. This is, this is, this is just the way that it is. I mean, it's the way our laws have been, and this is to protect the people. We, we want to, you know, that back years ago, if they didn't like something, and I'm talking about 150 years ago, maybe less than that, they, if they didn't like something, they'd take a person out and, and then hook them up to a tree and hang them. I mean, this, is, this was the old way of doing things. But we have laws today. We're not North Korea. We're not, uh, uh, we're not uh, Russia. Or we're not one of these countries that's like China. We're not like that. We don't do that. We have procedures that we go through. And what's happening is, is that people are taking advantage of those procedures and they want to jump ahead of the loop. They want to jump ahead. And that's the problem. And what that all boils down to is selfishness and self-centeredness. Now, I know I grew up back in the late 50s and 60s into the 70s, I went through a lot of the things that this country went through, going through desegregation and all the stuff, the busing of kids and all that stuff. And I have to agree, it was rough. I served in the military during that period of time. It was rough for those in the military because it was hard because we had to find ways to get along. I went to Vietnam with a lot of guys. I mean, the whole reality is, is that it's never been easy, but God never did say it was going to be easy. He said, we have to learn to get along. If you read your Bible in the Old Testament, brothers were fighting against brothers. You go back to the 12 tribes. After Solomon, the whole, all the tribes began to fight one another and, and, and kill one another. This was brothers, brothers and sisters and family. How do we get to the Civil War? The same thing in the Civil War. It was brothers and sisters fighting one another. There was one side against another side. Where are we going today? Where are we at today? People are going, I mean, people are drawing sides is what they're doing. They're drawing sides because they want to have their freedom. They still want to have everything they want in life, but they want their freedom. And the whole thing is I can do anything that I want to do. I can live the way I want. I can act the way I want. I can uh, talk the way I want to talk. People, that's what people are doing today. And it's growing and it's getting bigger and bigger. And what you've got here in America, you've got a two-party system, basically. You've got the Democrats and Republicans. And, and each one of them strive for power. They want power. They both want power. So the Democrats want their power back. The Republicans want to hang on to their power. And the thing is, is we, you and I, which are the people, we have to find a means or a way to be able to live with their decisions on the because we voted them in the office and put them in the place that they are. God has a lot to say about that. All you have to do is study the Old Testament. All you got to do is go to, to Moses and look at Korah. They had just come out of the promise. They just come out of Egypt. They were heading on their way to the promised land. Korah's, uh, Korah rebels and, and a one third, one third of them were destroyed. They were swallowed up in the earth. God called upon him. Moses called on God. God opened up the earth and swallowed them. So, I mean, the reality, folks, is that uh, God knows what's going on here. And uh, I think what we need to do, if you're a believer, is I think that you need to really just trust the Lord. Put your faith in Him. And I think we need to stand up for what's right. I do it all the time. I have a lot of people who don't like me because I tell it like it is. And because I'm honest. And I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm just trying to tell you where we are. And I've been doing that for years. As a missionary and as an evangelist across this country for many, many years. 
And I've been warning people, all you got to do is look on Amazon.com, Google my name, and you'll see all the books that I've written. Many books were written back during the Obama years, and I forewarned the people what was coming. I forewarned them. I said, this is what you're looking at. And we're there, folks. Everything that I, I spoke about in those books were there. We finally arrived. Now, what is going to happen? It's going to, it's going to be up to you and I and everybody else to be able to stand for what's right and to pray and to seek God and ask God that he'll intervene with all these folks that continue to riot and do what they're doing. But remember now, back in back when I was writing back in the 2014, 2013, 2012, I told a lot of people that what is happening is when you take God out of the picture, when you take prayer out of the schools, when you take God away from everything and, and you don't, there's no means for the younger generation to get it, that younger generation is going to be rebellious. Now let me have you give you something to think about. President Obama served for eight years. When he went into office, you take a child that was seven years old. By the time that he got out of office, that child was 14 years old. You take a child that was 10 years old, by the time he got out of office, he was 18 years old. That same child that was 18 years old today, three years, four, almost four years later, is 22 years old. You, what you've got is you've got a generation of young people that a president who rebelled, who caused division and schism and caused it what we have today, you've got the result of that. And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing it in the younger generation. This, uh, the, uh, these different groups that are forming, these are rebellious groups. This is rebellion. Obama pushed rebellion. He pushed it. He didn't openly say it, but he pushed it. And what you're getting is the result of eight years of President Obama. And now we're getting into another election after Trump has been in. And of course, all this that's landed on him, this has got to be heavy for this man. I mean, the, the virus and now all this demonstrations and fighting. And, no, and he got all these people, all the liberal media on his back all the time. He's got, uh, he's got the Democratic uh, people up there calling him names and going after his family. And doing, I mean, look at, I mean, common sense would tell me the man who is a very wealthy man would turn around and listen. Hey, guys, forget it. Take what you got. I'm going to go to some island and buy it. And I'm going to stay there. I ain't going to have nothing to do with you all anymore. That's what some people would say. And then you've got a fellow out there by the name of Soros, which I believe is the source behind all of this. I think he's putting up the money for all these people to come to these different cities. I think he's pushing all of this. I really do believe he's doing it. And I mean, there's some others out there doing it. See, folks, this world is corrupt. It's very corrupt. And Jesus Christ, he's the only way to get away from this world. Jesus, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father except through me. Oh, my friends, let me tell you something. I was going to speak to you, and I don't know if I'm going to get there or not. I was going to speak to you on the, do not put your candle under a bushel. You know, you're supposed to let your light shine. You're supposed to let your light shine. And what is your light? Is your light an evil light? Or is it a bright light? Is it a light? Is it a light that is glorifying God? Now we all have our ideas about things, and we we have uh, our methods of doing things, and we do things maybe different than other people sometimes, and, and not everybody likes us. But reality is this: is that we're all human beings, and God looks at us not at the color of our skin; He looks at the inwardness of us, the heart of us. Listen to this verse. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What is in your heart? What, what, what is really going on? How, what do you think? What do you dwell on? Do you, do you dwell on the negative or do you dwell on the positive? I had someone ask me today, uh, Preacher, what do you think about all this? I said, you know, when I get up in the morning, I say, thank you, Jesus, for another day. I'll soon, this in a couple months, two or three months, I'll be 75 years old. And God's given me a great life. I've had a wonderful life. I cannot complain about my life. I've been through some tough times. But I know that when I, I know that every day that I have is because God gives me that day. And that uh, I'm very lucky to have that day. 
You see, when you're young, you don't look at it that way. You kind of look at what you want to do and how you want to do it. When you listen to the news up here, you don't hear much on uh, on uh, uh, godliness. You don't hear a lot about it. Every now and then, something somebody will say something that's godly. But you don't hear about that the world needs God. You don't hear that. What you hear is that this is their opinion, one opinion, another opinion, another opinion. Their opinions don't mean a hell of beans because what's taking place is still taking place. How many of them have been honest enough to tell you the truth? That's the reality. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, my whole total dependence is on the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the same time, I have respect for people. I have respect for humanity. But I also will defend myself. And I will defend my loved ones. Because that's what we're supposed to do. And I will defend my God. I will definitely do that. Because that's, that is being honorable and being right. And that's what we all need to do, folks. We need to be right. We need to think that we're going, who are we, who are we hurting or who are we helping? Because that makes a big difference. Is who are we hurting or who are we helping? This, this, the message of Christ is a message of love. That's what it all boils down to. For God so loved the world, that's you and me, that he gave. He sacrificed. Will he gave his only begotten son. He only had one son. That whosoever, that once again is you and me, that believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's love goes out to everyone, folks. If you have a light, let that light shine. Let me read you a couple scriptures here. Um, Mark chapter 4. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on the candlestick? Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 34. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifest, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. There is nothing hid from God. God knows it all. If any man hath ears to hear, let him hear. That's the warning. If any man hath ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, he's talking to the disciples, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that here shall be more be given. Listen to what someone is saying. Don't believe everything they say. See that there's action in what they say. Because that's, what's, that's, that's what it's all about. A person can say they love you and not love you at all. There, there are people that make all kinds of promises but never keep those promises. One thing I have a hard time doing is someone promised me something and then not do it. God promised me eternal life and I believe he'll do it. <clears throat> For he that hath to him shall be given and he that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he hath. You see, and he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, and he knoweth not how. We, well, it's hard for us to explain. We can put the seed in the ground, and the next thing you know, we've got a plant coming. I went out the other day. I had to, in my yard, because we had a lot of bad spots, I ordered two, uh, two of these big things, of not seed, but sod. And my wife and I went out there in the hot sun and put that sod down. Boy, that was a job. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, Watch here. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. There's a process. Everything is a process. With God, everything is a process. Life is a process. A person is born, a person learns as a child, and they start, they get into their teenage years, and they get into uh, adulthood, and as they grow up, more responsibility is given to them. And sometimes too much responsibility is given to a child. But he said, but when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth it in the sickle, because the harvest is come. And he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what, with what, shall, what, what shall comparison shall we compare it? Now here's an interesting thought. It is like a grain of mustard seed. Now you ever seen a mustard seed? It's very, very small. Which when it's sowed in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. 
But he said, but when it's sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out greater branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. In other words, it's, so, it's such a small seed, you would think it would not become anything. But when it's planted and when it grows, it's huge. It really makes a big, makes a big tree. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Jesus spoke in parables so that the people, they had to think through what he was saying. And, and he, at, at a later point, he'd always tell them what the parable meant. Because these, this is what a parable was. It was a, a heavenly statement with an earthly meaning. A heavenly statement with an earthly meaning. But people didn't recognize it as earthly meaning. It was very practical. Most of all, us listen today, at least uh, those of us that are saved and are indebted to God. If you're saved today, you're indebted to God. He, he's the one that saved you. In other words, we'd not be where we are today, that is spiritually, if it were not for the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. For example, we would not be where we are today had we not heard the word of God. Uh, if we had not listened to the word of God, we would not be where we are spiritually today. Listen to what Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. We give thanks to God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Every one of us who are saved heard the word of God. You have Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. The night I got saved, the preacher presented the word of God to me. Perhaps we heard it from a preacher in church. Perhaps we heard it from a Sunday school teacher. Or perhaps we heard it from a soul winner who came to our home and took us down the Romans road. Perhaps we heard it from a family member or a faith, faithful friend who loved us enough to share it with us. Perhaps we heard it from someone else. But we are saved somewhere along the way or along the line because we heard the word of God. Take for instance a man that I knew uh, excuse me, I had the seat I got. I'm going to get a new seat. Uh, by the name of Andy. Andy uh, was an older gentleman. He was up in his 80s. I was out visiting, knocking on doors. And uh, everybody, many people had gone to talk to him. And uh, he, he turned them off. But I went and the Lord opened the door for me to be able to minister to him. It took an hour of listening to him tell me all his war stories. But I listened to him. And they were, it was quite quite interesting, World War II. And uh, when he got when it, when he got done, I asked him. I said, "Andy, are you saved?" And he he kind of scratched his head and he said, "Well, I think so. I think so." And I looked at Andy and I said, "Andy, now listen. I've sat here for over an hour listening to you tell me all about World War II and world stories, and you knew you you didn't have any problem telling me that. You can't tell me when you got saved. You mean you can't remember that?" He looked at me and he said, "Preacher, you got me. <laughs> you got me." Well, I said, Andy, don't you think it's time to get saved? Don't you think it's time? And he looked at me and said, yeah, preacher. Yeah, it is. I took the word of God and I showed him the word of God and led him to Christ and he gloriously got saved. See, it was the right time, it was the right place, and I just happened to be the right person to be there to tell him. And God spoke to his heart and he got saved, gloriously saved. That's what it's all about, amen? Not only did we hear the word of God, but by faith we received the word of God into our hearts. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, the believers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. What we need for to stop all these demonstrations and to stop all this rooting and all this evil that's being done is the word of God needs to be presented. 
I don't know if you ever heard the name Billy Sunday, but Billy Sunday lived in a very terrible time, prohibition time. And and Billy Sunday got up and preached. He's murdered the English language. He he got he just got up and preached, and hundreds and hundreds of people got saved because they heard the word of God. You see, the word of God, the preaching of the word of God, is not going out. We don't have street preachers, not like we used to have. We used to have people standing on the corner. When I was in Bible college, we would go out and stand on the corner and preach. Up in the streets of Roanoke, we'd go up and do that. Friends, I want to tell you something. A lot of things have changed. Now what happens when we receive the word of God? We are born again. Praise the Lord. We are born again. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 21 and 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth of the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptibility, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The child of God has a different outlook on life. The child of God looks to God, doesn't talk about it, but looks to God and lives for God and acts like someone that belongs to God. We have a lot of people say that they're Christians and say they're saved, but they act just like little demons. Terrible, awful. And so must we are greatly indebted to the Word of God because that's how we get saved. If it had not been for the Word of God, which we heard and which we received by faith into our hearts, we would not be born again. Now let me ask you a question. How can we, who are indebted to the Word of God, how can we pay or make good on that debt? How can we pay back to God what God has done for us in saving us? The answer to this question, in my opinion, is obvious. We can pay or make good on the debt by sharing God's word with others. By sharing God's word with others. If we had some real preachers out on the streets, and I know this would be tough, but we had some real preachers in some of these things put up a stand and just start preaching God's word. Who knows what could happen? Who knows what would happen in there? We'd have a great revival. If it had not been for the word of God, when I heard it, I would not be saved. I would not be talking to you today. Now, in our text, there are three parables. First of all, there is a parable of the lamp. That's verses 21 to 25. Then there is the parable of the growing seed, verses 26 to 29. And then there is the parable of the mustard seed, verses 30 to 32. In these three parables, we can learn that when it comes to the word of God, we have at least three responsibilities. First of all, we have the responsibility of holding it forth. Holding it forth. This means the responsibility of making it visible and accessible to others. Verse 21 of our text, Jesus asked the question, he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? We are to push ourselves out there. We are to be the light of the world. And that, that's what it's all. Are we hiding our relationship? People say, well, I don't talk religion. I don't talk politics. Well, let me tell you something. You need to talk about God. And that may be religion. You need to talk about that. And it may not hurt you to talk about politics. Somebody will find out where you're at when you get straight. Let me tell you a quick story. I was a young man. I was, uh, I, I was about 24, 25 years old. I was a full-blown Democrat. My daddy was a Democrat. He was in the union. My daddy told me that the only person that you can be is you've got to be a Democrat. And I said, well, daddy, well, all right. So, I mean, he said, Democrats for the poor man. You need to go with the Democrats. And I went off and I joined the uh, uh, JCs. I didn't know that J.C.'s was a Republican organization. I had no idea. But I sat down with some men and they began to explain to me the difference between what a Republican was and what a Democrat was. And I couldn't but not believe this, folks. I had been saved. I was saved. And uh, I could not believe what I was hearing. That the philosophy and the motive behind the Democratic Party was so much different than the Republican Party. And that didn't make that one was more religious than that. I didn't know that. But it seemed as though the Republican Party was a conservative party. It was, it was more for the man. It was more for the man to be successful. 
it wasn't it wasn't taking away from the man. By the way, if you're a Democrat, listen, you have not got anything out of them. They've got everything out of you. They've done nothing for you, nothing at all. It's by name. They claim the unions and stuff. Listen, the unions did the unions what they did. The, 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 that was nothing but a, a political movement on the part of the strong bosses in the union. I know I was in Local 519 in Miami. I mean, all of this stuff is, this is a bunch of garbage, folks. Listen, the reality is this, is that are you godly? Are you godly? Hold it forth. And he said unto them, it is a candle. We're supposed to take that light out there. Does your light or candle or lamp with the intent of hiding it under a basket under someone's bed or do you intend to put it in, in the candlestick holder are you letting it go forth the answer is obvious you don't light a lamp and then put it in a place where no one can benefit from the light but you put it in a place where it's visible where many people can benefit from the light as possible. When you got saved, Jesus saved you for a reason. He saved you so that you could go out and tell others and that you would be able to reach others. That's what he saved you for. That was the whole purpose behind it. The same principle applies to the truth of God's word. You don't take the truth of God's word <coughs> and hide it. Instead, you, let, you put it in a candlestick and hold it forth so that everyone can see it. Look what's going on around our country. Look at all the things that's happening. Do you see the light of God being shown? Do you? Do you see the light of God, friends? Do you see people holding forth their light? Do you see people praising God? No. The majority of the people that are what they're doing is cursing and they're calling people names, they're yelling and screaming about their wants, their cares about themselves. Everything is selfishly motivated. It's about self. And so first of all, when it comes to the Word of God, we have the responsibility to hold it forth. And then, number two, we have the responsibility to, to meet it out. In other words, we have the responsibility to share it with others, to take it. Look again at verse 24. And he said unto them, Take heed that ye hear with what measure of meat it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall be more given. In other words, God blesses you because you're telling others and because you're doing his work. God blesses you. He takes care of you. And that's a fact, folks. I can honestly say that I've been preaching uh, over 47 years, and I want to tell you, God's been mighty good to me. He's always provided for me. What we have here is what we can be called the law of sowing and reaping, which states that one will reap in proportion to what he sows. If these crowds of uh, demonstrators would uh, listen to God's word, they would find peace and a happy medium between one another. The real problem is they cannot solve their differences because of greed and self-righteousness. For example, this is true when it comes to our giving. Do we give out of a wanting to honor God and to bless God and to help others? Paul put it like this. He said, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. The law of sowing and reaping is also true when it comes to the treatment of fellow man. Listen to Jesus' words when he said in Matthew chapter 7, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with that judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and but with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured of you again. You know, someone was at with the judgment, for instance, this guy that, that, that killed this man. We saw that. But it's up to the court. It's up to the investigators. It's up to everyone else to see why it happened and what caused it. Because we don't know. We don't know. This man psychologically, this police officer, may have lost it, plain and simple. Just totally lost it. And that's bad. But it happens, folks. There are people that go from to anger to wrath. There are people that get, I mean, they just go crazy. I've known, I've seen it. I've seen people do all kinds of things that you'd never expect for them to do. We don't know why they do it. Let me share with you something I have learned or observed over the years as a pastor. I observe that those new believers who grow in the knowledge of God's Word, 
the most of those who get involved in a ministry where they are sharing what they are learning with others. See, if the Bible had been presented in the schools, if prayer was in the schools, if things were taken care of for all these young people, out of that you'd find a good group of people that have some type of values, some type of belief in God. I worked in the fair ministry, Amazing Grace Missions. And let me tell you something, I'm amazed at the number of people that have never read the Bible. Some I've even met people that have never heard of the Bible here in America. I mean, this, this is crazy. Why? Because it's not being taught. There's no prayer. I've talked with people and ask them, I've talked with young people, have you ever prayed? No. Have you ever heard your mom and dad pray? No. Have, they, have, they, have, they, have you ever prayed? No. They, they don't even know what to pray. They don't know who God is. That's why we're having the problem that we're having. It's because these people are searching for something, looking for something, and they can't find it. They can't find it in rooting and, 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 and going in and stealing and, and rebelling. And, they're not going to find anything at that. It's like the person who drinks. He gets involved in alcohol. They start and they, it makes them drunk and then they forget about their problems. But when they wake up, the problems are just as great if not greater. The reality is there, folks. The reality is that people are seeking. They don't know what they're seeking. They don't know what they're looking for. They've been, coupled, they've been put, put in their home for three months. They couldn't get out. They were fussing with one another at home and arguing. So when they got out, what did they do? They went nuts. That's what a lot of them did. The effect of this pandemic is going to go for years in the minds of many people because it's a form of PTSD. I, I know I have PTSD from Vietnam. I still have memories. I still have dreams. I still have those things. They still come to me. They've not gone away. They're there. They're engrafted in your mind. A car accident. Something while well, watching something that's terrible. 911. All of those things, those are things that are there. Let me tell you something. Little children right now, or with parents going up and down these streets seeing all this rioting and jumping and fire and all this stuff, that is being engrafted in those little kids' minds. It's no longer a game that they're playing, it's real. I mean, we got games with all kinds of things. Now, this is real stuff. But people don't realize that what they're doing to the minds of the young people. Watching it on television, the media is using it and driving it in the ground. It's running 24 hours a day without stop. What's it doing? It's angering people. It's causing them to want to rebel more. It's causing others to do stupid things. And no telling what's going to come off of all of this because of the stupidity of all this. There will be some people that are going to lose it completely. And no telling. They may want to take an AR-15 and go out and start shooting up everybody. Friends, this is crazy stuff. You see, the Bible also talks about the meat of it, and then it also talks about planet deep. When a person is grounded in God's word, God's word helps them. If, this, if the seed is deep, the plant's going to stay, stay. If the seed is not deep, the first wind that comes along, the first rain that comes along, it's going to blow it away. The first time a storm comes, a trouble comes. Folks, troubles are everywhere, and everybody's going to have them. But you've got to have something strong to help you get through the trouble. You, it's not that you think you're strong enough. You've got to have someone help you get through it. That's what God is there for. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross of Calvary for you. He's there to help you. He's helping you to get through it. I don't know what's going to happen here and, and, and all of this has taken place. I do know this. I've been in places where I've seen what he can do. I was in the Orange Revolution in Ukraine when it broke loose. I was there. I want to tell you something. Uh, friends, I want to tell you, I have seen a lot of things in my lifetime. And those things, I remember them. And I remember what caused them. I remember seeing them. The Vietnam War, all of that. You know, when I went off to Vietnam, I thought I was doing a good thing. And I really still believe today that I was doing a good thing. But I came home to, to a bunch of wicked, vile people. 
Oh, my friends, when I got off that airplane at Miami International Airport, I had my uniform on, and I had a lady walk up to me and spit in my face, call me a baby killer. I watched people burning their draft cards and burning the flag that I had fought for. I saw, listen, folks, I have not forgot that still engrafted in my mind. Still there. A nation that I went off and fought for, but yet there were people back here. And yet there were people burning their draft cards, people refusing to go and serve, people refusing to do what? We have, let me tell you something, all these people that are going out there and going into these stores and rooting, they're a bunch of cowards. They're running and they're scra grabbing stuff and everything else. They're a coward. Instead of going out and earning it, they're stealing it. That's, that's the wickedness that's in this nation. That's sin. That's the only answer for it is sin. Plain, downright sin. And we are now seeing it running rampant. And we're not, and I don't think it's going to end too quickly. I don't think it's over with too quickly. Because let me tell you something. People have come to the conclusion that we are where we are and we got to change. Are we going to change to the better or are we going to change to the worse? Are we going to lose our way? You know, when you study your Bible, you'll find that Israel was a perfect example of this. God continued to pull Israel out of its troubles all the time. He continued to help them. Finally, he comes to a place God does, and he says, listen, I've tried and tried and tried, but you continue to do what you're doing. You don't listen to me. You don't hear me. You don't do as I tell you. You don't love me. I'm done. I'm done. And I think maybe, I don't know, but I think God is getting to a place where he's saying, I don't know, maybe I'm done. Maybe it's time for my son to go get his bride. And let's, just, let's just cause this thing to end up. And folks, let me tell you something. This nation has been heading this direction. At least I know. At least I've seen it since the 1960s. It's taken this long to get it here. We have been fighting and squabbling amongst ourselves and squabbling over war and doing all the things. We get together for a few months and all of a sudden everybody's happy and everybody's united. And then the next thing you know, someone comes along and throws a wrench in it and all of a sudden we're fighting. And I want to tell you something. The wickedness of Satan is doing it. Satan is the snare that's causing all the problems. He's the one that's doing it. Satan continues to throw something in there that causes people to get off course. He does it to Christians. People that are saved, he'll throw a snare in a way and a Christian will get up and go the wrong direction. I've seen it over the years. I've seen how he can do it. Oh, my friends, listen to me. I'm just an old preacher trying to help you. And I'm going to tell you something. God loves you, but America's got to come back to God. And the only way it's going to come back to God is if we who are saved start talking about God more, start talking about the Lord more, start witnessing them more, telling people this is the answer. We need to stand on the, street, on the street corners and cry out. We need to be like John the Baptist and cry out, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Oh, my friends, we need to do that. I told someone the other day, I was talking, I said, I feel like sometimes I'm, I'm like Jonah. Uh, Jonah. God called me to say things and do things, and, and, I, and that's, I, won't, I don't want to be like Jonah. I don't want to run and get out and jump in the, end up in the belly of a whale, so I just tell it like it is. And you know, the whole fact boils down is that my job and my relationship with God is the number one thing. And I'm going to be honest and I'm going to tell it like it is. And I hope you don't mind because it doesn't bother me if you do. Because I love you in the Lord and I want you to be saved. And I want you to go to heaven. And right now, with the virus and all the things that's going on, there's a lot of people that have left. Over 100,000 people in America have died because of this virus. 104,000 I think it is of the day. My goodness, friends, look at the number of people around the world. And we've got them out there on the streets still doing the same thing. And the next thing you know, it's coming back. Next time it comes back, it may be far worse than it ever has. Oh, my. we got to get together, folks. we got to do something. And prayer is the answer. You need to pray and seek God and ask God to intervene. Let's pray. Father, I pray, God, for our nation. I pray for all these folks that are listening to this broadcast. And I don't know how many there are. But God, I pray that the ones that are will listen and God, that they'll look to you and say, God, help our nation. Help our nation to come back to God, to get back where they need to be. 
Oh God, I pray that men and women, boys and girls will be saved and will trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I pray, Father, that we will see a, a total repentance of this nation repenting and crying out to God just as they did in, in uh, that of Jonah and Jonah's time as he went to Nineveh. Oh God, I pray. We need revival. We need revival, God. Please, Lord, help our nation. Help these that are listening. Guide and direct them, Lord God. Thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Folks, I... I, I really hope that I've helped you tonight a little bit. I appreciate all of you. Please do me a favor. If you think this message was interesting and good for folks, pass it around. Share it with others. Because that's the whole, what I'm just trying to do is get the word out that Jesus loves you. He cares about you. If you need help, contact me. I'll be glad to do whatever I can to help you. You can email me or you can message me. Whatever it is. Thank you so much, friends. Have a great night and God bless you.